Good evening, brethren. Please take your Bibles and turn to Revelation chapter 6. Turn to Revelation chapter 6, please, in your Bibles. And the title for the sermon tonight is Wrath of Almighty God. Wrath of Almighty God. We are continuing this series on the end times and we've been talking about the rapture, the coming tribulation, the rise of the Antichrist. But then when the believers are raptured post-tribulation, you know, we believe in a post-tribulation pre-wrath rapture. So after we're raptured, the Lord God will pour out His wrath upon the world. And if you've been following the series, you know all about that. But I want you to look at Revelation chapter 6, verse 15. And uh, we want to look at the length of, of the, or the timing of God's wrath. You know, when it begins and when it ends. Look at Revelation 6, 15. And this follows after the sixth seal is opened. This follows after the sun and moon is being dark. And you can read that for yourself again in the chapter if you like. But in verse number 15 it says, And the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the rocks and mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne. Notice the next words. And from the wrath of the Lamb. Look at verse 17. For the great day of His wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? Notice that they, these people that are left behind, they don't go up in the rapture, they're not believers. You know, many of these are those that have taken the mark of the beast, that have worshipped the dragon and the, and the antichrist. And they notice now, when the Lord comes in His clouds, in His great glory, they notice that this is the great day of his wrath the great day of the wrath of the lamb so when does god's wrath begin it begins after the rapture this is why we're pre-wrath rapture believers we believe god will pour out his wrath after the rapture now please turn to revelation 19 revelation 19 let's get uh the end of the wrath of god when does the wrath of god end in revelation 19 verse 11 Revelation 19, verse 11, it reads, And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. So now we're reading the portion of Scripture where Christ comes back, uh, comes from heaven on a white horse upon this earth. Now drop down to verse number 15. It says, And out of his mouth, that's out of the mouth of Jesus, goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth, notice the next words, the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. So you notice when he comes on his white horse, he destroys the, the Antichrist, he destroys his armies, the armies of the Antichrist. This is, this is being told us that this is the wrath of Almighty God. And so God's wrath begins after the rapture, and it ends as Christ comes back on that white horse. It's the end of that wrath, because of course, when Christ comes back on the white horse, he now sets up his millennial reign. So the wrath of God is over at that point in time. So the title, once again, is Wrath of Almighty God. That's what we get there in verse number 15. Revelation 19, verse 15, again, at the end of it, says, And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. But once again, the title for the sermon tonight is Wrath of of Almighty God starts at the revel at the rapture, ends as Christ comes back on the white horse. Now, one thing that, um, as I've been going through this series, one thing that I realized that I've not made clear, and I guess I've made it not clear on purpose because it, it requires uh, you know an explanation. I want this explanation to to be told now in this sermon is the day of the Lord. We saw that the day of the Lord is the day of God's wrath. It, it's the day that starts off, that kicks off. The pouring out of God's wrath. And something else that I've said in my series is that the day of Christ is the same day as the day of the Lord. Now, a lot of people don't realize this, but I want to show this to you. Please go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse number 1. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 1. <clears throat> because one thing I want to make clear in this, in this sermon is that the day of the Lord and the day of Christ, it's called the day for a reason. You know, when we think of a day, the first thought that should you know, come to our mind is a standard 24 hour, 24 hour period, right? The day of the Lord. But we know the wrath of God is longer than a day. 
We know that the wrath of God is from the rapture, like I said, to the coming of Christ on the white horse. So what is the day of the Lord? Can we understand this in light of the wrath of God? What is the day of Christ? Well, look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse number 1. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. Hey, that's the rapture. When we gather together unto Christ, look at verse number 2. That ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit or by word or by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. So what is the day of Christ? It's the day that the rapture takes place in. It's a standard 24-hour day. That very day, whatever day, day that becomes, the day that Jesus Christ comes and gathers the saints unto him in the rapture. That's the day of Christ. Now, just to confirm this a little further, I'll just read to you from Philippians 1, chapter, uh, verse 6. Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, which says, Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until, until when? Until the day of Jesus Christ. So whenever you read your Bible about the day of Jesus Christ or the day of Christ, that's talking about the day, a standard day, 24-hour period, where Christ will come and gather his believers. He will rapture his believers into heaven, into the clouds to be with him. The day of Christ is the day of the rapture. And so, of course, Christ will do a good work in you from the day you've been saved to the day that you receive your new resurrected body. Then, Lord Jesus doesn't need to do any more work in you. You know, you're, full, you're complete because you have that new body without a sin, without the sin nature. Now, you're, you're in 2 Thessalonians. Please go to 1 Thessalonians. Go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse number 1. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse number 1 reads, But of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you, for yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. And of course, the day of the Lord, you know, we, I've proven this before, is the day of God's wrath. This is what the sermon is about tonight, the day of God's wrath. But notice it's also called the day. It's another standard 24-hour period. And it is the same standard 24-hour period as the day of Christ. It's the exact same day. Well, why is it called two different things? Well, what do we notice? When the Bible speaks about the rapture, the coming of Christ, this day is referred to as the day of Christ. It's the day that we are looking forward to being gathered together with Jesus Christ. But when it comes to the non-believing world, when it comes to those that reject the gospel, the day of the Lord is a day of wrath. And we saw that believers are not appointed to wrath. We're not appointed to God's wrath. And so the day of the Lord, even though it's the same day, it's looking at it from another angle, and it's looking at it from the angle of those that will suffer the wrath of God. Okay? So it's the same 24-hour day, the day of Christ, for believers, it's, it's, it, it, it sounds better for us to say the day of Christ, being with Christ, than the day of the Lord that we know is the day of God's wrath. We're not appointed to that day, but it's, it takes place on the same day. Now, let's look at the, uh, the graphs that I've uh, shown you. And if we look at the first slide, I'll put this on the video so you can see it. Just as a reminder, we saw that after the rapture, after the sun and moon is darkened, on that day that the sun and moon is darkened, we are raptured. That's the day of Christ. But on the same day, God begins to pour out his wrath on the day of the Lord. Okay? And then I've shown you the next slide, which I've put it into a, more, a better time scale. So you can see how it all fits out. You can see that, that, that God's wrath you know, is a period that, almost, that is almost three and a half years. Okay? It's, a, it's a, sig a significant portion of time where God will pour out his wrath on this world. But notice how I've also put under that, under, under God's wrath, I've listed day of the Lord. Okay? Now, that's not 100% accurate. It, it is accurate, accurate in the sense of, of me wanting to uh, show you the, this table, show you this uh, time frame. But actually, if we were to just focus on God's wrath alone, if we were to just remove all the other distract, distractions that's in this slide and look at God's wrath alone, you'll notice now that there's a little sliver that I put there in God's wrath at the very beginning, 
That is day number one of God's wrath. That is a standard 24-hour period that I'm speaking about. And that first day of God's wrath is known as the day of the Lord or the day of Christ. Okay, that, that very first day is known as the day of the Lord and the day of Christ. But then the next period of time that leads up to the end of the seven-year period, that entire thing is God's wrath to the time when Christ comes back riding on a white horse. Okay, so I don't want to, you, you, to, be mis, you know, to misunderstand. The day of the Lord is God's wrath, but the day of the Lord is the first day of God's wrath. Okay, and God's wrath will continue. And that's what we're going to be focusing on in this sermon. Now, if we were to take that one standard 24-hour day and just focus in on that day and to see what that day looks like, it'll be on the next slide what it kind of looks like. And in the next slide here, you know, we have a couple of things. We will know we're in that 24-hour day. We're, we're in that final day. We'll know it when the sun and moon are darkened, when the stars fall from heaven. We'll know it when it's the celestial darkening. And we'll know this must be the sixth seal. That's when we'll know this very day we're standing, when the sun and moon go dark, we'll know this is the day of Christ. We'll know this is the day of the Lord. It's the same day that this takes place. And of course, after the sun and moon is darkened, the rapture takes place. The Lord comes in the clouds and gathers his believers unto him. Okay, But the day is not finished. And also, you know, as I've been going through the, through the, uh, through the slides, we've always stopped at, at the sixth seal. We've not looked at the seventh seal yet. Okay? And uh, I wanted to wait until we got into the Sermon on God's wrath to explain what the seventh seal is. So after the rapture, the seventh seal is opened. Okay? And the seventh seal is not God's wrath just yet. But it's all taking place in one day. Okay? The seventh seal is half an hour silence uh, in heaven. You know, a half an hour period takes place of just silence. All the believers of the earth have been raptured and things go quiet for a moment, just for half an hour. Half an hour later, the first trumpet is blown, okay? And the first trumpet is what begins God's wrath. This is, this is still the same day, just half an hour later after the rapture, same day, the first trumpet sounds and this is the day of the Lord, okay? Now, of course, the day of Christ, which points us to the rapture, the day of the Lord, which points us to God's wrath, all takes place in that standard 24-hour period. All right? I want you to remember that. So the sun and moon gets dark, and when that happens, we'll know this is the day of Christ. We'll know this is the day of the Lord, and we'll know we can just lift up our heads for our redemption draweth nigh. Christ is coming. Then we're in heaven. There's half an hour period of silence. Then God begins to pour out his wrath at the first trumpet now i've shown you that let me let's go to the scriptures and make sure that the scriptures are supporting what i've just explained to you so please take your bibles and go back to revelation go to revelation chapter 8 for me revelation chapter 8 and let's have a look at the seventh seal revelation chapter 8 the seventh seal verse number one revelation 8 verse 1 reads and when he had opened the seventh seal so this is after the sixth seal. This is after the sun and moon are dark. And this is after the rapture. Remember in Revelation 7, you had a great multitude appear in heaven of every tribe, of every tongue, praising the Lord, those that came out of great tribulation. So it's after the tribulation, after the rapture. And when he had opened the seventh seal, it reads, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. So there's the half an hour of silence. Look at verse number two. And I saw the seven angels, angels which stood before God and to them were given seven trumpets. All right. So have the seven trumpets been blown yet? No. Okay. The seven trumpets aren't given to the seven angels until the seventh seal is opened. And when the seventh seal is opened, there's half an hour of silence in heaven. Okay. Half an hour, hour period. So it's all taking place in the same one day. Then the seven trumpets are given to the seven angels. And these seven trumpets, don't, don't forget that the people on the earth said that this day, this is the day of, of the wrath of the Lamb. So this is the very same day, the day of the Lord, that begins the wrath of God. Okay? And so the seven trumpets are the wrath of God. Okay? The seven trumpets and the seven vials that we read about later in Revelation, and I'll get into that later on, this is all the wrath of God. Now, before God allows the first angel to blow his trumpet, God prepares for his wrath. Okay, so notice in Revelation chapter 8, verse number 3, 
It says, And another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer. And there was given unto him much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense, which came with the prayers of the saints, ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. So notice, this angel goes to the altar. And from the altar, he, he, uh, he, um, he, he takes like a, uh, like a censer for, for incense. And in that incense, he gathers together the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar. Okay? Now, what's happening here is that before God pours out his wrath, He's taken in one final time all the prayers of the saints from the altar. Say, what is that about? Well, I believe this is about all the saints that have ever lived. Every time they've cried unto the Lord during tribulation, any time they've been persecuted or they've been put to death, you know, that they've had the fears where they've cried unto the Lord and asked the Lord to defend them and asked the Lord to bring judgment upon the, the, the workers of iniquity, to bring judgment upon the beast, upon the Antichrist, upon these that are, that, are, that are persecuting the people of God. God takes in these final prayers one last time, listens to them, takes them in, breathes them in, you know, and, and this works up God. He, he prepares him to the point where, you know, his love and kindness and his mercy is over. And now it's time for his wrath to be poured out on a wicked world. Okay? Say, so where do you get that idea from? Well, again, keep your finger there. Go to Revelation chapter 6. Revelation chapter 6 and verse number 9. Okay, so remember, the prayers come from the altar that is before the throne of God. And in Revelation chapter 6 verse 9, the Bible reads, <clears throat> And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God. So under the altar, the same altar where he gets the prayers of the saints, we have the souls of the saints that have been slain, that have been killed for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. Look at verse 10. And they cried with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? So they're asking, God, how long? How long is it going to be until you take revenge? When you take vengeance on these people that have killed us? Verse number 11. And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. So it says, look, you've got to just rest for a little season. There are others that will be persecuted, that will be put to death by the Antichrist. Okay? So all these prayers that are coming from the souls of men under the altar, you know, make up this incense which the Lord takes in and begins pouring out his wrath. You know, just, just hearing the, the, the cries of help from his children one more time, you know, for him to be so angered, so filled with wrath that he starts to pour out these supernatural events onto the earth. Okay. Now, I'll read to you another passage. Actually, look at verse number 5, Revelation 6, verse 5. Uh, sorry, sorry, Revelation chapter 8 and verse 5. Revelation chapter 8 and verse 5. If you go back there, it says, And the angel took the censer and filled it with fire from the altar and cast it into the earth. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. So notice he, he takes this censer, he fills it with fire from the altar, and this fire gets cast down onto the earth. This is prior to, or as this first angel is about to sound his trumpet. Now, the, the thought that I go to is in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. I can just read it to you. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 6, which reads, Seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. So it's a righteous thing for God to recompense or take vengeance on those that have caused tribulation upon you. Verse number seven. And to you who are troubled, rest with us. Hey, what did he say to the souls that were under the altar? Rest for a little season, okay? Because God's vengeance is coming. God's wrath is coming. Rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. This is, of course, the rapture. You know, with, with his angels, he comes, he gathers up his elect. But then it says in verse number eight, in flaming fire, taking vengeance 
on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, so this vengeance, this wrath which is about to be poured on the earth, the Bible calls this flaming fire. And so it makes sense when in Revelation chapter 8 that this incense or this sense, uh, censer is filled up with the fire of the altar, which were the prayers of the saints, those that were being troubled, persecuted by a wicked world. And God's hearing those prayers, being, being roused in anger, in, in his wrath, and pouring out this fire, pouring out this wrath to come. Back in Revelation chapter 8 and verse number 6, we now begin the sounding of the seven trumpets. Revelation chapter 8 and verse number 6. And the seven angels which had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. The first angel sounded, and there followed hail and fire mingled with blood. And they were cast upon the earth, and the first part of trees was burnt up, and all green grass was burnt up. I mean, this is the first sound of the trumpet. You know, when we looked at the seven seals, a lot of it, especially the beginning of, of sorrows, was just natural disasters. You know, pestilences and, you know, right now with the coronavirus. This is just, you know, a, a natural uh, consequence of a sin-cursed world. You know, but there comes a time when God will step in and supernaturally cause you know, damage on this earth, you know, pouring out his wrath. And the first thing we see was hail mingled, uh, hail and fire mingled with blood. And so, and it says one third of the trees are burnt up. I mean, all that, I mean, we had major fires, didn't we, in Australia just a few months ago. But it compares nothing to the fires that will take place where one third of all the trees will be burnt up. And, and all the green grass will be burnt up. All, there won't be any grass left after the, the, the first sounding of the, of the trumpet. Now, grass will grow afterwards, of course. But at this point in time, all grass will be burnt up and one third of the trees destroyed. And notice that it also says, it's not just hail. So it's got your, you've got your hail damage, you've got the, the, the damage of fire, but it's also mingled with blood. And so, you know, I'm trying to wrap my head around what this means, but it looks like blood's just literally going to be falling from heaven. So, you know, one third of the trees, yeah, burnt up, but other places of the world, just, just blood, you know, places just filled with blood that's fallen from heaven. I mean, just, uh, just think about that. Just think about that sight. Hail, fire, blood, just falling from heaven, destroying the earth. The wrath of God is, is beyond, you know. I mean, thank God that we're not here. Thank God that he takes his believers uh, from here. But again, there will be some witnesses of the Lord during this time and they will be protected from the wrath of God. You know, that's outside of the scope of this sermon though. But let's, uh, let's go to verse number 8. And the second angel sounded, and as it were a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea. And the third part of the sea became blood. And the third part of the creatures were, which were in the sea and had life died. And the third part of the ships were destroyed. So what I believe is happening here with the second angel sounding is a great mountain. Look, it's not actually a great mountain. It says, as it were a great mountain. So this is most likely, and it says with fire. So this is most likely a meteor. You know, something, you know, the size of a mountain, a meteor, you know, falling onto the earth, you know, coming down, you know, with, with that tail, as it were, a fire, you know, smashing into the sea. And it causes a third of the sea to become blood. I mean, think about that. Think about the, entire, you know, the oceans of the world. Just a third of it becoming blood. And this makes sense because a third of the creatures, a third part of the creatures which were in the sea and had life died. So, of course, any, any marine animal that, need, that lives in the ocean, if all of a sudden their environment turns instead of water to blood, of course it's going to perish. Of course it's going to die. I mean, you can imagine the stink you know, that's going to be caused around the world because of the di this dying of these org organisms, of these creatures, you know, in the sea. And then it says, and the third part of the ships were destroyed. So whatever ships are on the, on the ocean right now, you know, will be ultimately destroyed because when, once this media hits, you know, it'll create, you know, tidal waves, it'll create amazing, you know, uh, uh, you know, in, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? You know, the waves will be roaring, you know, it'll be, the ships just won't be able to handle it. You know, one third of the ships will be destroyed by the waves. Or even, maybe even sailing on blood. I don't know what kind of effects that could have on ships. 
but a third of the ships will be utterly destroyed on the oceans. Look at verse number 10. And the third angel sounded, and there fell a great star from heaven, burning as it were as a, a, were a lamp. So I believe this is another meteor coming from heaven, a great star. You know, we talk about a star, you know, we talk about like meteors that are shooting stars. I believe this is what we're seeing, a shooting star, another meteor falling on the earth, uh, on, on the earth burning as it were a lamp, and it fell upon the third part of the rivers and upon the fountains of waters. And the name of the star is called Wormwood. And the third part of the waters became Wormwood. And many men died of the waters because they were made bitter. So Wormwood, if you, if you look up what Wormwood is, um, we have a plant that we call Wormwood. And uh, this type of plant is known for its bitterness. Okay? And so when you have this, uh, this media you know, fall again on the earth, you know, uh, Parts of it are going to fall in rivers, parts of it on, mount, on waters, on fountains of waters. What I think is happening here is as this media enters into the Earth's atmosphere, you know, you probably are aware that, you know, it starts to fall apart, you know, and bits and pieces of a media that comes onto the Earth, you know, it's, it falls apart to the point when it, when it actually falls, it's, it's actually a lot smaller than it was in outer space because the atmosphere of the Earth has ripped it apart and pieces of rock have flown everywhere. So it looks like this media, there are pieces of it just flying off it, and it's falling in different areas, you know, areas that God has ordained uh, on places where people would generally drink water from. You know, it'll, it'll damage, you know, water supply here. And, you know, not only will the water turn bitter, but it'll be poisonous. It'll be poisonous from this, from this media. And anybody that drinks of the, those waters will die. Uh, so, you know, just just amazing, uh, amazing situation that's going on here with the wrath of God. Look at verse number 12 now. Drop down to verse number 12. And the fourth angel sounded, and the third part of the sun was smitten, and the third part of the moon, and the third part of the stars, so as, it, so as the third part of them was darkened, and the day shone not for a third part of it, and the night likewise. So, you know, what does it mean that a third of the, part, third of the moon, the stars, and the sun were smitten? Well, I believe the end of verse number 12 explains what that means when it says, and the day shone not for a third part of it. Okay, so the day. When you think about how many you know, hours are there in a day, you know, generally speaking, there's 12 hours. You know, from the time the sun rises to the sun sets, you know, it's, it's roughly 12 hours. Of course, it depends if you're in your, you know, you know, your summer months. You know, it depends on the seasons. In the summer months, you have more day. Uh, if you're in, in the winter months, you've got more nights. But generally speaking, as an average, it's 12 hours of day, 12 hours of night. Okay, so 12 hours a day. And then it says, and the day shone not for a third part of it. So what's a third part of 12 hours? If you divide 12 into three, that's uh, um, four hours, right? Four hours. And so instead of having daylight for 12 hours during the day, we're only going to have daylight for eight hours. And the other four hours, it's just going to be completely dark. Okay? But not just during the day, but during the night. Because again, this, that, this, this, the effects of this uh, falls upon the, the moon and the stars. And so during the night, of course, during the night, you know, the, the night sky is lightened by the moon, by the stars. You know, this is why when you look at night, it's not completely dark. You've got some light coming from, from the heavenly objects. But again, four hours of the night, it would be completely pitch black. Okay? So when you put four hours and four hours, four hours a night, four hours in the day, you've got eight hours in the day, okay, um, where it's just completely, a third of the entire day is just going to be completely dark. You won't be able to see your hand in front of your face. If you've ever gone to a room where it's completely pitch, pitch black, you can't see anything in front of your face. It's kind of scary, okay? And so uh, these are the effects that's going to have, you know, during this, uh, I think during the first week of the coronavirus, um, where we had the, not, not the first week of the coronavirus, but the first week of the lockdowns, where people were trying to figure out, you know, who can go out, what are, what are essential businesses, these kinds of things. Well, our area suffered a blackout, okay? Uh, not just my house, but all the houses in my area suffered a blackout for, I can't remember how long, it was a couple of hours, I think. Um, but I remember when I was driving home, you know, I, I had all of my, my mind, I was thinking about the virus, I was thinking about what this could potentially mean, what's going to happen, and then I get to my house and everything's dark, I mean, the street lights aren't working, the, 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 um, um, the stop signs, you know, I mean, the, uh, the stop lights, you know, they're off, everything's completely dark, completely dark, and the only light that I can see are the light of cars driving, and I'm just thinking, man, the virus, now it's a blackout, it's like, you know, is this the end of the world? 
<laughs> and look, that's not even, that doesn't even compare to the kind of disaster that we're going to see when God pours out his wrath. You know, what, what a time it'll be when there's complete darkness. How much, you know, men's hearts will fail, you know, because of the great fear during this time. Look at verse number, if you can now go to Revelation chapter 9. Revelation chapter 9 and look at verse number 1. Let's keep going. We've seen the first four trumpets being blown. Look at Revelation chapter 9 verse 1. And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. So now we have another star fall from heaven, but now this star is a him. And actually we, lined, we learned that this is an angel. Okay, so sometimes angels are referred to as stars as well in the Bible. So this star isn't a media, but it's an angel. And, and to him was given the key of a bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pits, and there arose a smoke out of the pits, as the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air was darkened by reason of the smoke of the pits. And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and unto them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. So these locusts are not your average locusts. These are not your natural locusts that we know about. All the different species of locusts that are on the earth. No, these are locusts that are locked up in the bottomless pits. Okay? This is like hell. They're, they're locked up. And you need an angel to come and open up this bottomless pit for these locusts to come out. These are locusts of hell. Okay? These are locusts that live under the earth. And so they're released and they have power like scorpions. Look at verse number four. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth. Notice the grass has come back now. The grass has grown back. Neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. So there are believers that are going to live during this time that are going to be witnesses after the rapture that are on this earth witnessing for Christ. But notice they have the, a mark upon their head. That's the name of the, of the Father. And they're going to be protected. They're going to be sealed by, by God. They're going to be protected by God's wrath. Okay. And then it says in verse number five, And to them, so that's to the locust, it was given that they should not kill them, but that they should uh, be tormented five months. And their torment was as the torment of a scorpion when he striketh a man. And in those days shall men seek death and shall not find it, and shall desire to die and death shall flee from them. So it's saying here that these locusts are going to come and they've got stingers like scorpions. And they're going to come and sting man. They're going to sting everyone that doesn't have the seal of God on their foreheads. This is everyone that's followed after the Antichrist, everyone that's worshipped the dragon. All the men that are not believers during this time will be attacked by these, these locusts from, from hell. Okay? And the sting is going to be so bad. It's going to go on for so long that people are going to die. In fact, it's going to go on for five months. We read there in verse number five. This sting will be going on for five months that people are going to seek to die. People are going to desire to die because that's how bad the torturous pain is. But it told, it told us here that in verse number six, uh, that death shall flee from them. They're not going to be able to die. Okay. So how does this make sense? You know, what if someone were to, you know, go on the top of a, of a building, you know, and, and throw themselves down, you know, could they die? I, I believe that, yes, they could die. Of course, the, the natural means that any man could die, they can die normally, right? But I think what's happening here is, and if you look at verse number 10, look at verse number 10, it says here, and they had tails like unto scorpions, that there, that there were stings in their tails, and their power was to hurt men five months. Okay, so these, these locusts have the, the venom in their stings is for the purpose of stinging men. Now, when you look up a, a normal scorpion and you find out, you know, obviously the scorpion has venom in its, in its sting, in its tail. And the reason it's got it is when, when the scorpion um, is hunting, when it finds its prey, you know, it holds onto the prey with its claws and then the stinger comes in and, and, it, and it injects that venom into the prey, into the little insect that it's eating, whatever it is. And the purpose it does that is to paralyze the insect, to paralyze its prey, so then it can eat it. Okay, so, so what I believe, and of course, <clears throat> the average scorpion is made to hunt for insects. 
you know, to hunt its prey. These locusts with, with scorpion tails, they are made, they were created to harm men, to sting men. So instead of the prey of a scorpion being paralyzed, men, I believe, are going to be paralyzed by the sting of the venom from these locusts. And that's why they can't die, okay? Because they're paralyzed. You know, they, they can't go up, climb up, uh, you know, a st- a stairs on a building and throw themselves down and, and, and perish that way. They're paralyzed. They, they can't move. They can't function for five entire months during this time where God pours out this wrath, you know? This trumpet is blown. Five months of paralyzation where you can do only the minimum, you know, I, I suppose, and you can't even kill yourself if that was your desire. All right, look at verse number 13. Drop down to verse number 13 now. Revelation chapter 9, verse 13. And by the way, before I read verse number 13, notice that this period of time for the, for the, uh, for the locusts, this, their, 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 um, their judgment is for five months. And so this is why I'm saying the wrath of God is longer than one day. We have the day of the Lord, the day of Christ. Yes, that's the first day. That's when God starts everything. But the wrath of God has to be longer than five months. Okay? And of course, we know that this is for the rest of the three and a half years to come. Uh, or, the, or I should say, sorry, the, end, the rest of the seven years, because then Christ will come back on that white horse. Look at verse number 13. And the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel which had the trumpet, Loose the four angels which are bound in the great river Euphrates. So, let's stop there. God is saying there are four angels that are bound in the river Euphrates. Okay. Look at verse number 15. And the four angels were loosed. Okay, so they're restricted right now, right now. For some reason, they are in Euphrates River or under the river, however the Lord has it. But these four angels are going to, going to be loosed when the sixth angel sounds his trumpet. And it says in verse number 15, And the four angels were loosed, which were prepared for an hour and a day and a month and a year for to slay the third part of men. So the reason these angels exist is to slay a third of mankind. And now it's time for them to be loosed. They've been prepared for this. Verse number 16. And the number of the army of the horsemen were 200,000 thousand. And I heard the number of them. Okay, so these four angels have these horsemen at their disposal, this great army, which makes up 200,000 thousand. That's 200 million. Okay, 200 million of these horsemen. Verse number 17. And thus I saw the horses in the vision, and, and them that sat on them, having breastplates of fire, of J- and of jacinth and brimstone, and the heads of the horses were as the heads of lions, and out of their mouths issued fire and smoke and brimstone. By these three was the third part of men killed, by the fire and by the smoke and by the brimstone, which issued out of their mouths." So whatever population is still alive on the earth during this time, after God's poured out His wrath here, a third of them are going to die from, this, from these armies, from this 200 million strong army, which is under the command of these four angels. So I, I assume each angel has 50, uh, 50 million of these horsemen available to him, and they go out throughout the entire world. One third of the population perish by the fire and brimstone which come out of the mouth of these horses that have heads like lions, right? Mouths like lions. And then it says in verse number 15, um, For their power is in their mouth and in their tails, for their tails were like unto serpents, and had heads, and with them they do hurt. Now, I've heard in in previous preaching on the end times, I've heard other uh, preachers say that these could be tanks. It could be that somehow, you know, 200 million tanks are used under the power, the influence of these four angels to go about. So it's like another world war that's taking place and a third of the world is perishing. I mean, it could be. It could be that the, the Apostle John is writing or seeing these things and he sees these tanks he's never seen. He doesn't know what, the, you know, what are these things. And the best way he can destri- describe them is like these horses with his armor that issue out these fire. It could be, I, I suppose, 
Uh, but when I, I, I thought, well, you know, how many tanks are actually exist on the earth today? How many, how many tanks have been built throughout, you know, all the different nations of the earth? You know, could we have something like 200 million out there? And well, the, the country that has the most tanks in the world right now is Russia. They've got 13,000 tanks. Uh, the next nation that, that comes almost uh, equal, but it's actually USA, but North Korea is not far behind. Both USA and North Korea have about 6,000 tanks. Australia has about 60 tanks. Okay, we have 60 tanks. You know? But when I looked at the entire world, and of course, you know, a lot of this is based on estimation. But when you look at the entire world, there's about 90,000 tanks. 90,000. That's very short of 200 million. Okay. So, you know, either this is so far away into the future where, you know, you get to a point where you have this many tanks, and so it's not something that's going to happen in our lifetime, potentially. The other, the other thought about it is, you know, maybe, you know, as we know, the Bean of Sorrows, we have this great world war. So, of course, during warfare, during a great world war, you know, the military industrial complex will be manufacturing their weaponry, their tanks. You know, maybe it's not just tanks. Maybe this con also considers, you know, other um, vehicles of warfare potentially as well. But so, you know, just, just in looking at that, looking at that number of 90,000 tanks today versus the 200 million that is mentioned of the horsemen, I think... Um, I think we're, 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 I don't believe necessarily that these are tanks. I think most likely these are other supernatural creatures, like the locusts which came out of the bottomless pit, that these four angels in the Euphrates River has the power to command these creatures as well that, uh, this, that kill one-third of the world's population. But anyway, you, know, you might have a different opinion on that. I'd be curious to know what you think. Now, if you can go to Revelation chapter 10, please. Go to Revelation chapter 10. We've looked at the first six trumpets, okay? Now we're going to be looking at the seventh trumpet. But before we read into the seventh trumpet, I just want you to notice what entails, what, what, what's taking place during this time in Revelation chapter 10 and verse 7. The Bible reads, But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, notice the next words, the mystery of God should be finished. Okay? So with the seventh trumpet, there comes a finished work of God, a finished mystery of God, you know, a finalization of some sort. And what I believe this is, what's being finished here is the wrath of God. Let's keep reading. The mystery of God should be finished as he hath declared of his, to his servants the prophets. Now please go to Revelation 11. Revelation 11 verse five, uh, 15. Revelation 11 verse 15 to get to where the seventh trumpet is sounded. It said here, Revelation eleven fifteen, and the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven saying, what, notice what the words, the, what they're, what's being said by these great voices in heaven. The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Amen. Great words. All right. So with the sounding of the seventh trumpet, this is where the mystery of God should be finished. And it's finished because the nations of the, of the world, the kingdoms of this world, are given over to, to Jesus Christ. And of course, we know that Christ afterward will reign for a thousand years. Okay? And this is Revelation 11 that we're reading. Revelation chapter 12, it starts all over again. We start off with the vision of the woman and the birth of Christ. So we know we've gone back in time. It goes into the beginning of the three and a half years and we see things play out all over again. But I want you to notice, the trumpets are the wrath of God, right? And then at the seventh trumpet, there's a finalization. There's a final a pouring out of God's wrath and we know that the kingdoms are given over to Christ. And as we saw in Revelation 19, he comes, you know, he, he destroys the armies of the Antichrist, and then he receives the kingdoms to himself, okay? The millennial reign of Jesus Christ on this earth. And Christ, of course, will reign forever and ever, not just a thousand years, because at the end of the thousand years, he gives that kingdom over to his Father, the new heavens and the new earth, and God will reign for, for, you know, forever and ever over his people. All right. Now, I'm not, I don't have time to go through the seven vials today. Um, I, I, you know, I, I, my purpose is just to show you what the wrath of God is like and the time frame that it fits within. 
But just touching on the seven vials, because I want you to see this as well. If you can please go to Revelation 15 and verse 1. Revelation 15 and verse number 1. And of course, you can read about the vials in your own time. But how does it take place? You know, some people believe it's seven trumpets. Then God pours out his seven vials. But no, we saw at the seven trumpet that the kingdoms become the kingdom of Christ. So is, is God going to pour out his wrath of, you know, upon the kingdoms of Christ? No. Okay. So, but we saw that the first trumpet takes place after the rapture. Okay. And we know that the seven trumpet takes place at the end when Christ comes back to receive the kingdom to himself. All right. So when it comes to the vials, it actually takes place at the same time as the seven trumpets. And I'll show you this. Look at Revelation 15 and verse number one. Revelation 15 and verse number one. Notice this. And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. Okay. So what are the, 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 these plagues that are about to happen, these seven angels with these vials? It's known as the wrath of God. Look at Revelation 16 now. Go to Revelation 16, verse number one. Revelation 16 and verse number 1. It says, And I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, Go your ways and pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. So is there any mis mistake? You know, can you mistake God's wrath with the vials? It's, it's the same thing. God's wrath are the vials, but God's wrath are also the trumpets. So let's understand this second retelling of the events of the end times, which starts in Revelation chapter 12. Again, we mentioned that it talks about the birth of Christ. And then it goes into the first three and a half years, the beginning of sorrows during chapter 12. What do we learn after the beginning of sorrows? In chapter 13, we have the rise of the Antichrist, the great tribulation, the persecution of God's people. And then in, Re in Revelation chapter 14, we saw the rapture. You know, uh, Jesus Christ coming in a cloud and reaping his harvest. But also, if you look at Revelation 14, verse 19, look at Revelation 14 and verse 19, what else do we see? It says, after Christ comes and, and, and uh, gathers his harvest, an angel comes and also uh, gathers, it says in verse number 19, and the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and cast it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. So in Revelation 14, we have uh, the rapture, but we also have the announcement of God's wrath. It's about to be poured out. Then we saw in chapter 15, verse number one, that God's going to pour out his wrath, these last plagues. And then we have in Revelation 16, that the seven vials are known as the wrath of God. So it all plays out perfectly. You know? So this is what is most likely taking place. Trumpet one is blown, vial one is poured. Trumpet two is blown, vial two. Trumpet three, vial three. Trumpet four, vial four. Trumpet five, vial five. Trumpet six, vial six. Trumpet seven, vial seven. Okay? And if this lines up again, we saw trumpet seven talks about the kingdoms of the earth becoming the kingdoms of Christ. Well, let's look at uh, Revelation chapter 16. Look at Revelation 16 with the seventh vial, Revelation 16 and verse number 17, Revelation 16 and verse number 17, the Bible reads, and the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air, and there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying, it is done. Remember how the mystery of God was finished? Well, notice here, it is done. The wrath of God is done here. In verse number 18, and there were voices and thunders and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such as was not since men were upon the earth, so mighty an earthquake and so great. And the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. And great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. Okay? So when it comes to the seventh vial, yes, it's in line with the seventh trumpet, but the seventh vial is specifically about wrath upon this mystery Babylon the Great. And I haven't got time in this series to go through the Babylon the Great. Hopefully one day when I go through the book of Revelation, I'll cover all of that. Okay? So we saw that Revelation 16 has the end of that uh, vial being poured out, and we saw that it was done. Okay? It's done. 
Then in chapter 17 and 18, we have the destruction of Mystery Babylon the Great, okay, which is all about that seventh uh, um, vial. Then we go to chapter 19, where we have Christ coming on the white horse and again, finally destroying the armies of the Antichrist, throwing the beast and the false prophet into the lake of fire. And then chapter 20 in Revelation, we begin the millennial reign of Christ. Christ reigning on the earth for a thousand years. All right, now please turn to, to John chapter 3 for me. Let's end on John chapter 3. John chapter 3 and verse 36. Because, you know, these are events, this, this wrath of God, these are events that I would not want any of my loved ones, family, friends to, to experience, Okay. And I already mentioned to you that believers will not experience this, okay? But John chapter 3, and look at verse number 36, the last uh, verse in the chapter. John chapter 3, verse 36, it reads, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. Notice the next words. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Who's going to experience the wrath of God? Who's going to go for this period of the seven trumpets and the seven vials? Hey, those that do not believe on the Son. Those that do not believe the Gospel. They're going to be the ones that go through the wrath of God. And look, even if you were to die as a non-believer before these events take place, even if you were to die rejecting Christ as your Savior, you're going to be thrown in hell. I mean, you're going to experience God's wrath in fire, in, in flames of fire, and eventually you're going to be cast into the lake of fire where you'll be tormented forever and ever. And so, brethren, you know, the reason God tells us about his wrath, we see that God has, you know, he's very long suffering. He has great mercy. You know, it would be fitting for God to destroy the earth. In fact, he destroyed the earth with a flood in the, in the days of Noah. But God is, is, is waiting. God is, is allowing for his wrath to be built up. He's, he's giving time for people to believe on Jesus Christ as Savior so they would not have the wrath of God abiding on them. Okay? And thank God, once we're saved, we will not see God's wrath. We will not go through this ter terrible time. We will not suffer God's wrath in hell on the lake of fire. You know, we'll be caught up in the clouds to be with the Lord forever. And so, you know, if there's anyone listening to this and, you know, you don't want to experience God's wrath, I don't want you to experience God's wrath. You know, all you need to do is believe the gospel. You need to believe on Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who died for your sins, who was buried, who rose again from the grave uh, three days later. If you were to place all your faith and trust on Jesus Christ, believe that he has given you everlasting life, ask him to save you, he will, and you will avoid God's wrath. The wrath of God will not be abiding on you. And brethren, for us that are already saved, praise God, you know, we see the future, we see what's coming, you know, and I hope this has given you some further understanding of God's wrath. You know, we have a, a, a God of great love, but we also serve a God of great wrath. And thank God that that wrath is not going to fall upon us. You know, that the curse of the law actually fell upon the Lord Jesus Christ as he was crucified on the tree 2,000 years ago. He took on our sins so we don't have to face God's wrath. Thank God for his blessing. Amen.